Hi, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Marco Bertoni. I am a uh, chairman for this session. And also, I am the guy opening the door for... <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Charles. <laughs> Yes, uh, I'm Marco Bertoni, I am a main supervisor for Massimo, I am the chairman for this session, and I'm now introducing the session a little bit, guiding you through the different stages of this event. Uh, first of all, our PhD candidate, Massimo Parotto, is going to present this morning his work uh, related to a, a model-based <coughs> methodology for value assessment in conceptual design. Uh, we have a pleasure to have uh, Daniel Soban uh, from uh, Queen's University Belfast to be opponent today with us. And we have a grading committee composed by Associate Professor Mario Storga, Professor Katerina Rizzi, and Professor Anna Orban. And uh, just to remind you, we'll have a presentation about 30 to 35 minutes. Maxwell will present his research. We will have a leg stretch just for logistical issue. We'll have opponents sitting here and Massimo moving, moving to this table. Uh, the opposition will start, I think, around 10 o'clock, and uh, it will last about one, one and a half hours. Uh, then it will be an uh, opportunity for the grading committee to ask questions, and then uh, the audience will have also the opportunity to ask a few more questions. Uh, then we will close the session, and uh, we, the supervisors, and the grading committee, we will meet uh, together to decide. Uh, I also have to say that we are live streaming on YouTube, and you will find the link on our Facebook page. So I think I said everything I should say. Yes, title and thesis, etc. So Massimo, now uh, I have a pleasure to let you start. Thanks. Thank you, Marco. So welcome everybody to my to my presentation. So my friends invited me to watch the last Star Wars movie that has been released two days ago, and uh, I said yes. But I also recognized that I never watched a Star Wars movie in my whole life. So I, decided, so I decided to watch the first Star Wars movie to get an understanding about what it is. And I really like the movie. And I especially like the scene where there is the duel with the swords between Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker. And I got so excited that I also wanted to build a sword to be able to, to beat Darth Vader myself. So as an engineer, I came up with a concept. And I developed a model of it. And this is the model that I developed. So. <laughs> So now I'm going to test if it's going to be Darth Vader or if I need to make some modifications. <laughs> it seems I need to make some changes, right? So we engineers are used to build models to aid our decision making. So we are used to build models to understand if the decisions that we made on a concept are actually correct or if we need to make changes. But when a problem becomes more complex than a sword, for example a car, we can't wait until we build the physical model of the car and we test it because it will take so much time and it will be so costly, especially if we need to make changes. So what we use is we use virtual models to increase our level of awareness on a lot of issues. For example, we can use the um, we can use a virtual we can understand the impacts on the aerodynamics of the car. Then we can understand how the car will resist to impacts. And then we, uh, and also we can understand the impacts on the ergonomics for both the passenger and also for our employees at the, at, at the production line. But when we're using, the problem when we are using these virtual models is that we already made a lot of decisions on the details of this concept, uh, of this product. And how can we instead use models in, in, even before we can use these virtual models? So in the conceptual design phases where we are just, where we are just uh, deciding upon multiple concepts and we, don't haven't, we, haven't detailed the, we haven't detailed them yet. So we just know the general geometry of them, we have just decided on, on the technical features that they should contain, but we haven't decided on the details of them. So how can we use models in this, in this very early phase of design? So this is, the arrow, this is the area where I'm working on, and I'm especially working to increase the awareness of engineers on one specific issue. And this is about value. So I had a good understand, I had uh, some definitions about what conceptual design is, but there are so many definitions out there about what value is. So here, uh, my, when I started the PhD, uh, my first task was to review literature 
So to understand the different definitions of value, and also I compare these definitions with other publications that are looking into how industry and engineering design are moving nowadays. So at the end I formulated my own definition of value to at least to understand what for me engineers should think, should be aware of when they are taking decisions about value in conceptual design. So industry nowadays is not just looking into improving the technical performances of the product, but is looking into providing more holistic solution to satisfy more sophisticated needs and expectations. So at the same time, they are also uh, trying to reduce the resources that the customer will have to spend in order to satisfy these needs. And at the same time, they are also trying to reduce the resources that this product will, will require to other stakeholders, for example, the environment. So I elaborated these visions into my own definition of value. So for me, engineers, when they are taking decisions in conceptual design about value, they should consider at maximizing the fulfillment of these needs and, of needs and expectations, while at the same time trying to minimize the resources that, they are, that, are, that both the customers and other stakeholders will have to spend. But so, from what I read in, in our Bible of product development, which is Product Design and Development by Ulrich and Eppinger that we use in all our courses, it seems that from what I read here is that all the products are, deliver, are um, developed to deliver value. And so that all the decisions in product development should be based on how much this product is delivering value to the stakeholders. So from what I read here, I didn't know exactly why my research was needed. Because to me here, it seems that the engineers are very, very much aware about value. And value is what they are considering every day and in every decision that they are taking. So then I started to find, I started to look for examples to get an understanding about why I get this task at the beginning of my PhD. And then I found the example of the Pacer, which is a car developed in 1971 by uh, American Motor Corporation. And they had the purpose of developing a wide, small car. So this car was wider than all the other cars in the, present in the market in that specific class but it was also shorter. And the customer, when the car first came out in the market in 1975, they really liked this odd looking car. And so the sales went really up. But also the interest started to wear off in the second year of that the Peso was in the market. And this was because the, the Pacer had a very low fuel efficiency. This was because the Pacer was waiting too much. And the fact that a car had to be fuel efficient was really important in the American market in the middle of the 70s because of the oil crisis in 1973. So this means that the engineer should have kind of understood and predicted this, uh, this value in 1971 when they started the development of the Pacer. But it didn't happen. So it seems that, the, that we engineers have difficulty to kind of understand and predict what will be the value of our product for the customers and what would they will be their preferences for, for the product very early on in the design process. So here I started to get curious and I started to ask myself, uh, and this is the first research question, so what are the factors that are making that engineers are more or less aware about value in conceptual design? And what are the factors that are hindering the fact that they are not so aware, that, are not aware, that they are not aware in conceptual, uh, are not aware about value? And at the same time, I also recognized that uh, I wasn't experienced enough. So I needed to interact with practitioners in industry to get an understanding about how they, take the, how they make value-oriented decisions in conceptual design. So I followed a research methodology. Uh, so I started by reviewing literature, as I said before, and uh, to review what are the different definitions about value and also to get my, my own definition about value. I also started by to interview uh, practitioners in industry to understand the current state of practice in industry and to understand if there were problems that could be supported by a, metho by, by a methodology or a support in general. When I found these problems, uh, I started by developing the support and I was developing the support and improving it by 
improving by having itera interactions with practitioners in industry. And then I also did experiment with students and analyzed the data using protocol analysis and ethnography. So I will first share with you uh, what are the factors that are hindering uh, value-oriented decisions in conceptual design. And then, I will, uh, and then I will explain to you what will be the support to, for uh, the support for this. So the first challenge is related to the quantification of value. So basically, engineers require numbers and facts to take decisions on a concept. But at the same time, they report to the fact that there are many aspects of value that are very, very difficult to judge and quantify in conceptual design because there is a lack of data and information. So here you can have two risks. So one risk is that engineers just focus on what they can account and quantify. And so basically they lose awareness on those softer aspects, but it can be very important to determine a more successful concept. Or that they take decisions on these softer aspects based on their own assumptions and intuitions with the risk of making erroneous decisions as well. And the other challenge is related to the interpretation of value. So when there is a complex product that is made by many subsystems and components, you do not have that customers uh, express a need for a specific component such as a door. Eventually they express needs for the entire system, so the car. This means that the needs are interpreted by many people and, and then validated into design requirements, so measurable properties that, that the components should have. And these requirements, they are giving the, um, they are uh, giving the base for the decision making in, uh, in conceptual design. And there is a challenge with this. And uh, to explain this challenge, I will turn this slide uh, using an asphalt compactor as an example, because this is the context where I worked on, because I didn't work with the pacer. So when you have a complex product, such as a, an asphalt compactor, you have that the needs are interpreted, validated, and cascaded down to the subsystems of the product, which are in their, on their turn interpreted, trans validated, and cascaded down for the components of, uh, of, uh, of the system. This means that when engineers receive the requirements on the component level, so here the drum, this means that much time has been passed. And also, it means that they have very little time to do the development. So what they do often is that they start before, and they ask for preliminary versions of these design requirements, which eventually may change along the way when the requirements will be finally cascaded down in the requirements engineering process. So here, they will start the development here, but then the requirements might change. And so maybe they have made wrong decisions here at the beginning of the development, and the design is already constrained when they get validated requirements at the end. And also, at the same time, you have the problem that the requirements, they are not giving exactly much information about the context in which the customer will operate the product. And this is very important when you're taking trade-off decisions between two different, requ two conflicting requirements. So if you have two conflicting requirements, you should look into the, co the context in which the customer will operate the product, and you should try to understand what are the properties that the customer is preferring, to understand which requirement you, which requirement you need to trade. But engineers do not much have information about this context. And this is specifically important if you take an asphalt compactor because if you are, if you are compacting a road in a, in a small road like uh, in my hometown in Verona, uh, the customer has completely different preferences. For example, when you, when you are compacting a very large road in the desert and you have many rollers that are working, uh, that are working in parallel and then you have to fleet. And so, um, and so here you have a difficulty to understand what are the customer preferences in this different context. So value is very context dependent and engineers do not have much information about this context. So these three factors are giving a skewed awareness about what's ca what customers value in a solution. So you have the, the problem of quantifying value, the problem of the interpretation of value, and the fact that value is context dependent. So how do we go and solve these problems? Well, the solution that I propose in the thesis is basically to use value models 
to model the needs and expectations of the customers the, and the stakeholders to the components of the system very early on in the process. So that here you can start to iterate the design requirements that you are receiving and iterating back and forth from the component to the whole system and down again. And so in this way you will iteratively uh, develop the design requirements and you will negotiate and interpret the design requirements. So giving to a better understanding about what customer value during the development. But then how can we how can we model value in such an early phase where we do not have much data and information? So here I started to ask myself the second research question of my thesis, which is how can deliberation about value conceptual design be supported by a model-based approach? So here again, I started to interact with practitioners to, to gather requirements for a model-based approach. So how a model-based approach should look like. And then for the quantification of value, engineers express the need for having an objective function to understand how to quantify all the value aspects that are coming from their analysis. And at the same time, they reported the need for having value measured in, in relative terms. So usually what you do is that you want to understand how, solution, how concepts are better or worse compared to a design taken as a baseline. So you want to make relative comparisons and you, and you do not, not want much to, make, uh, to have an absolute measure for the value of a concept. At the same time though, they reported the fact that in conceptual design, you're not just interested to calculate which option has the highest value and then, to, uh, and then to make the selection of that concept. Because probably you have made a lot of assumptions in, during, the, during the quantification of value. So here you are more interested to make these assumptions explicit and to understand how you can improve the design by, interact, by sharing knowledge with other people from other parts of the organization. So here the value model has, hasn't just to calculate value but also to become a discussion facilitator between these different the people that are working within, with, in different functional areas. So here, literature suggests that when you're, so the value model basically becomes a representation or a boundary object, as described in literature, to start these conversations. So by having, by having engineers to assess value, they will have to make their assumptions explicit. And so by making this assumption explicit, they can confront each other if the perceptions differ. And so this process is especially important to, to be able to make judgments about those softer aspects of value that are, not, that, that are very difficult to judge and quantify because, they, because of a lack of data and information. And then to understand how the value that is context dependent, engineers uh, would need to have um, a scenario-based approach for value. So that they can understand, they, they can have more information about the customer operate, will operate the product. So I developed these requirements and I developed a model based approach for how engineers could assess the value of their design concepts from the needs collected in the market analysis. And the methodology features one qualitative loop where we use more narratives and qualitative scores so that the engineers can start, can start the discussion, they can start the definition about what customer value. Uh, and also, at the end, you can get a qualitative design merit for a design, and you can compare how the different concepts differ from the baseline. And then it features a quantitative loop where you try to translate all the aspects that came from the qualitative loop to get an understanding about what will be the monetary benefit of this design. And perhaps what is the, what the most interesting aspect of the methodology is this phase, where you have the convergence verification. So where engineers meet and, they, uh, and, they, and you gather the results from the qualitative loop and the quantitative loop. Because it's here where, uh, where you can start the discussion, because you can see if um, what are the results of the qualitative loop and the quantitative loop and you can take the decisions about how you can improve the design uh, by looking at how by looking at how you how you model value and so then the purpose is also to 
uh, modify these value models. So I will go first uh, through the qualitative loop. So in the thesis, you can, you can find uh, this qualitative loop detail in many activities that you should perform. But I will not go into the details of all of them, but I will focus specifically on, uh, on, some on the most relevant aspect of the methodology. So I will explain to you um, the activity of grouping needs into valid drivers, and then how you could uh, quantify and how you, can, uh, uh, how you can qualitatively quantify, qualitatively get a, a, an indicator for the value of a design. And I will take an asphalt compactor as an example to explain better um, these activities. So again, from our Bible in product development, it suggests that you should collect the customer statements to drive the concept, uh, the concept development activities. So, but the problem of collecting needs, so there are different problems with uh, collecting needs and to use them for decision making. One problem is that these needs are not linearly independent, so they are a little bit overlapping with each other. So it can be that if we are improving a property in the product, for example, with visibility, we are impacting more needs, and so this creates a problem to, to, for decision making. And also you have the problem that sometimes the needs, they have a different level of granularity. So when the customer express their statements, sometimes they are expressing real needs, so very solution independent needs that they have, and sometimes it's that they are expressing more like a technical feature, so something that is very specific to a technical feature. So here the, the methodology suggests that to, to group these needs and to sort out these needs into a series of value drivers. So basically the value drivers are decisions criteria that try to translate this need into uh, the natural language of the engineers that are working on a specific solution, but still being independent between each other, uh, so being uh, independent between each other and also being independent from the solutions that you are going to assess. So that you can use these value drivers for different types of assessments. So one, uh, so one need can have an impact on many value drivers. So for example, uh, the, if you have the statement to complete the construction project consuming less energy, this can be broken down into fuel consumption and electricity consumption. Or, or a value driver can have an impact on many needs. So the need for visibility can have an impact both to have um, to complete the operation, compaction operation without stops, because if you have better visibility, basically you can see better and then you don't need to change direction. And also the fact that you have better compaction quality because you can go and you can do a more precise compaction in the, lead, in, in the edges of the, of the asphalt pavement, so to say. So basically, when you collect these value drivers, you need to correlate how the engineering characteristics of, of this concept, so basically the measurable properties that differ between the different concepts. It could be, for example, in an asphalt compactor, the turning radius, the drum width of the asphalt compactor. So you need to correlate how these have an impact on the value drivers and to aggregate them in order to get the final measurement for the value of a design. And one popular method is quality function deployment, which assigns, <coughs> which assigns correlations such as 0 0.9, 0 0.3, that are correlating how the engineering characteristic has an impact on the value drivers. The problem with this method is that it doesn't account for negative relationships. So you can't account, for example, the fact that you need to decrease the turning radius if you need to decrease the fuel consumption. Because if you, have a, a, if you decrease the turning radius of an asphalt roller, you can, basically, uh, you can basically have better trajectories, and so basically you have less fuel consumption. So you can't model this, you can't model this relationship with uh, quality function deployment, because it just accounts for positive relationships. Otherwise, you will make the, uh, the, con the calculation wrong. And also, it doesn't allow you to make more complex uh, relationships between uh, engineering characteristics and value drivers. So for this purpose, I used, instead of quality function deployment, I used another methodology, which is called the CODA, which stands for Concept Design Analysis. And the Concept Design Analysis, you do the same thing in, as QFT, but then you use nonlinear relationships 
between the engineering characteristics and the value drivers. So here you can model by this function, for example, you can model the fact that you that you need to decrease the turning rate, you need to minimize the turning radius if you have a better impact on fuel consumption. And at the same time, you can use optimization function. For example, if there is a specific measurement for an engineering characteristic to optimize one specific value driver. So then you use this method, you aggregate the results, and you get the final semi, we can say semi-quantitative uh, measurement for the value of a design. But when I use this method in, in industry, one, re, one, uh, one of the feedback from the industrial practitioner was that it was very difficult to understand what are the rationale behind this, the, the functions that you have in these metrics. And so it would be very hard to use this metric as a discussion facilitator between the team, because it's very difficult to understand these this correlation numbers and to understand why you have this, this correlation. And so for this purpose, I added another. I added another matrix that that they call the sh a shadow corda matrix. So in this in this matrix you do the same as you do with the coda matrix, but then you are just writing, you are just setting the correlations with a narrative form. And so here you can write the rationale be behind the, the relationships. So for example, here you can write the fact that you need to minimize the turning radius to uh, you need to minimize the turning radius to have more efficient traje trajectories between uh, when you are compacting sharp bends. So here you can, the engineers can use the rationale to start a discussion because they can understand why, why the coda matrix uh, is giving that value. And so basically this is very important, especially if you want to use this result for later projects, because maybe the people that did this matrix, they probably retired or changed job. So if you want to reuse the knowledge that is contained in this matrix, this coda matrix is very, uh, is very helpful to understand the rationale behind the numbers in the coda matrix. And so basically you should do it, it should be the opposite. So in product development, in development, you should do first this narrative coda matrix and then you turn these correlations, uh, you turn these relationships into correlation in the coda matrix. The quantitative loop, um, the quantitative loop again, you have to perform many activities that are detailed in the thesis, but I will not go into the details of them, but I will focus on the main aspects, which is the combination between an operational process model, a functional model to develop performance model to calculate the monetary value of a design. <coughs> so the total cost of ownership uh, so the quantitative loop is based on a total cost of ownership definition. And the total cost of ownership aims at calculating all the aspects of cost that the product will incur in the life cycle. And as you can see here, you have many acronyms, and all these acronyms are basically cost items for different life cycle phases that the, pro that, uh, the product will encounter. So cost that the customer will have to spend uh, to operate this machine. And so what I want, so what I wanted to do is, so this function is not new, but what I wanted to do is that I wanted to measure, uh, to calculate the value of a concept, for example, a drum, to calculate what are the different uh, the total cost of ownership items along the life cycle. But the problem with this is that if you want to do this calculation and to populate this equation, then you need to understand what are the scenarios in which the customer will operate. Because if you're using the drum in a very small road, you will have some cost impact. And if you are using the, the drum in a very large road, you, you, you will have different impacts. So here, the idea was to model uh, the scenarios in which the customer will operate so that you can link the component that you are considering to the scenario and to populate this total cost of ownership function. And so the qualitative loop, in the quantitative loop, uh, you first define the operational scenarios and their mix. And for this purpose, you use an operational model. Then you connect how the component connects to the whole, to the whole product, so the roller. And for this purpose, you use a functional model. And then you connect the, the information, the, the relationships that are in these two models into performance models. 
So performance models are ad hoc models, we can say, that are aiming at calculating one particular cost item that you saw in the total cost of ownership equation. So you can have, so in the empirical study, I developed a repair model, a maintenance model for the machine, an operational cost model, and so on. But when you, did, when you have done the qualitative loop and the quantitative loop, then you gather, then you, you, you present them in the converge verification phase. And here is where, uh, you can, where these models, they can act as boundary objects. Because basically you can see the total cost of ownership savings of, a con of concepts compared to the baseline, and also how concepts increase instead the total cost of ownership for the customer. So that you can decide probably that this option is better because you have more savings. So the customer will save cost with that concept. But probably here you will see in the qualitative results that maybe there is another concept that is better because it has a good impacts on, on aspects that you weren't able to quantify because of a lack of data and information. And so here is where you can use the narrative coda metrics to understand what is the rationale and to understand what were the assumptions behind this model. And so here you can start sharing knowledge with other people that are working from different functions. And then you can start the discussion about, okay, so what do we need to improve the design to, to, to deliver even more value? Because probably there can be another design that is probably better if you do some changes. And so here you, we start to trigger the discussion about what changes do we need to make. So, what is the feedback from the industrial practitioner about the use of this methodology? So here I run interviews with practitioners where I show the methodology and I show uh, the example of them and I show the different models. And, uh, and this is the feedback. So basically to, to understand how the methodology is effective, I need to take back we need to take back again the research question that I had, the second research question that I had. So how can the liberation about value conceptual design be supported by a model-based approach? So now we can understand if what the practitioners are saying and if the, what they are saying is basically giving an answer to that question. And so here I brought two, two quotations from uh, interviews. And here what I wanted to focus is just on three, is just on three main verbs. So one is to reason. The other one is to see, and the other one is to point. Because here you can understand how the liberation about value in conceptual design can be supported by a model-based approach. So what the practitioners are saying is that they are not exactly interested to calculate the value of a design in a conceptual design phase. Because you don't, know, you don't have yet much data and information. And especially you want to understand in conceptual design how you can improve these concepts along the way. So it's not just to decide which option is the best, but how you can improve it. Because you have still much time to improve, you have still time to improve it. So here, the 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 purpose of the model is more to enable the reasoning. Because if you have a value model, basically means that you have a representation of what you think the customer value. And then, if you have these representations, then people they can start to point at it, and they can start to understand if their perceptions is different from the others and why. And so this is enabling this cross boundary or cross-functional knowledge sharing between the people that are working with different other, other functions, for example, marketing or aftermarket. But this, uh, is, um, but this feedback is still very qualitative, right? So can we get a quantitative measurement of how a value model ha increases the uh, has a better behavior, why designers that are using a value models have a better behavior than engineers that are instead using more traditional representations, such as, for example, a requirements list that you have here in our Bible of product development. So for this purpose, you need to, you need to make some hypothesis of what kind of good behavior you want to achieve. And so for this purpose, I review literature to understand what literature is saying that this should be a good behavior to increase the liberation about value conceptual design. So here I developed two hypotheses. So one is that the value model compared to the requirements checklist increases the discussion about the problem in conceptual design. And this is because literature is saying that if you increase the discussion about the problem, 
rather than just developing, proposing a solution, then you have a more thoughtful discussion about what the problem is. And so you are taking better decisions. The other one is that the value acts as a more effective boundary objects compared uh, to the requirements checklist because it facilitates the discussion between the, the cross-disciplinary team. And for this purpose, I run design experiments, actually using that camera and others. And so uh, here I developed the experiments with students here at the university. And the students, there were 22 students, and I got really lucky actually to work here at BTH because the students, there were some from mechanical engineer, engineering, some from industrial economy, and some from the international program of sustainable product innovation. So you could, you could, um, so you could uh, say that they are a, a cross-disciplinary team because they have different backgrounds. So what they did to, uh, so what they gave to the students is that I gave them to a design task, and then to three teams of students, I gave a value model, so uh, a um, like a definition of a CODA model, like the one you saw before. And then to the other teams I gave instead a requirements checklist, which is suggested in this, in this Bible of product development. Uh, and then I, so I didn't tell them what was the purpose of the experiment, and I recorded the, the sessions, and I transcribed the, the conversations that they were made during the session. And then I analyzed this data using an established methodology for, uh, that is called protocol analysis. So to answer to the second hypothesis, I also run an, an ethnographic study by looking at the transcripts and by, uh, and by uh, seeing how a value model acts a more effective boundary object. And to answer to the first hypothesis instead, I made, uh, I used this protocol analysis. So for the protocol analysis, so the protocol analysis method helps you to basically quantify how much time the different the designers are spending on different activities of the design. So for example, how much time they're spending on understand, uh, discussing the problem, how much time they're spending proposing solutions, how much time they're spending analyzing solutions, and so on. So if you wanted to support that hypothesis, you need to have what kind of measurable success criteria in the experiment allows you to say that you are supporting the hypothesis that you are having. So uh, the, the measurable criteria that I had in the experiment were these three. So one is that the engineers increased the time spent on designing the problem. That will support the hypothesis one. Then that you have a decrease of the time spent proposing solution in the first half of the experiment. Because it means that the engineers are not jumping directly into solution, but they are thinking about what the problem is, and then they propose solutions. And instead to, uh, then the measurable success number three is that uh, was to decrease the total standard deviation between the phases. So this means that we are giving with a value model a more structured approach so that the engineers are, are behaving, they know what phase should follow each other. And these are the results. So for the first measurable criteria, we can say, uh, we can see that the value model, so the black arrow here, is increasing the, the time spent on analyzing problem. And that seems to support the first hypothesis that we are having. The second one is that we see that the teams are, are spending more time proposing solution in the first time of the experiment if you're using a requirements list. So basically the requirements, they are giving you the they are giving you measurable properties that you should fulfill, and then you try to find technical solution for this. But you do not go and to find what is the problem behind uh, these requirements. And for the third measurable success criteria, you have to uh, you you can see that you have a lower standard deviation if you're using the value models. This means that the teams, if you look at the three teams that use the value models, they had a more structured approach. And so they, they basically they were performing the, they were kind of performing the activities on the same level. So to conclude, I will take back the, the research question that I had at the beginning. 
So how were our decision makers of value in conceptual design? And the first challenge is related to the quantification of value, as we said before. Then you have the interpretation of value. So the value is interpreted by many people and through many steps. And this gives us square, a skewed awareness about what customer value in a solution. And then the value is context dependent. So engineers do not have much information about what customer value in a solution. How can the liberation of value conceptual design be supported by a model-based approach? You have that value models are suggested to give more context, in, in, to give more information about the context in which requirements are generated. At the same time, engineers require a monetary function to be able to quantify in monetary terms the, um, the results that are coming from their analysis. But at the same time, if you want to deliberate about value, you need also to consider those aspects of value that you are not able to quantify conceptual design because of a lack of data and information. And so for this purpose, the value models have to act as discussion facilitator, especially with those uh, professionals that are working in other functional areas, such as marketing and aftermarket, to enable to take, make decisions about those aspects that you are not able to quantify conceptual design. And so after this, May the force be with you, and uh, thank you.